A little over two weeks ago, I announced that the Justice Department had taken significant enforcement actions against the largest, most violent, and most prolific fentanyl trafficking operation in the world, the Sinaloa Cartel. I said then that the Justice Department is doing everything in our power and using every authority we have to bring those responsible for the fentanyl epidemic to justice. That includes holding accountable the drug traffickers who use the dark web to commit their crimes. Drug traffickers are increasingly turning to the dark web to sell illegal drugs in exchange for cryptocurrency. They may advertise their drugs on dark net marketplaces as brand name pharmaceuticals, but in reality, the pills are often counterfeit and laced with fentanyl. The drug traffickers are confident that by operating anonymously on the dark web, they can operate outside the bounds of the law. They are wrong. I'm joined today by FBI Deputy Director Paul Bate, DEA Principal Deputy Administrator Lou Milioni, Chief Postal Inspector Gary Barksdale, IRS CI Chief Jim Lee, and FDA, FDA Investigative Services Division Chief Daniel Burke. We are here today to announce the results of an unprecedented international enforcement operation led by the FBI known as Operation Spector against traffickers of fentanyl and other drugs who operate on the dark web. Operation Spector was a coordinated international law enforcement effort spanning three continents to disrupt drug trafficking on the dark web. It involved agencies across the federal government, along with our partners at Europol and Eurojust, and law enforcement agencies in eight foreign countries. It was led by the department's Joint Criminal, Opioid, and Darknet Enforcement, or J-Code team. Across the US and eight other countries, Operation Spector resulted in a total of 288 arrests and the seizure of 117 illegal firearms, 850 kilograms of drugs, and $53.4 million in cash and cryptocurrency. This represents the most funds seized and the highest number of arrests in any coordinated international action led by the Justice Department against drug traffickers on the dark web. Here in the United States, our Operation Spector investigations involve the FBI, DEA, ATF, and more than 30 U.S. attorneys' offices, as well as our partners in other federal agencies. In the United States, we arrested 153 defendants, seized 104 illegal guns, and seized over 200,000 pills, including those containing fentanyl. To give just three examples of the cases that made up this massive operation since it began in October 2021, in the Central District of California, a defendant was charged with drug and weapons offenses for his role in leading an organization that obtained bulk fentanyl, operated labs that used high-speed pill presses to create pills containing fentanyl and methamphetamine, and sold millions of pills to thousands of customers on the dark net. In the Southern District of Florida, we secured the conviction of an individual who distributed narcotics, including fentanyl, on various dark web marketplaces. That defendant possessed a list of over 6,000 customers across the United States. And in the Eastern District of California, two individuals were charged with drug and money laundering offenses for their role in selling tens of thousands of counterfeit oxycodone pills containing fentanyl in exchange for cryptocurrency on the dark web. I am extremely grateful to the agents, prosecutors, analysts, and staff across the department who participated in this operation, including the FBI and its J-Code team, the DEA and ATF, our U.S. Attorney's offices and OCDF, and multiple divisions, sections of the criminal division, including the computer crime and intellectual property section, the money laundering and asset recovery section, the narcotic and dangerous drug section, the fraud section, and the Office of International Affairs. I also want to thank our partners across the federal government for their assistance in this operation, including the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, IRS, IRS Criminal Investigation, Homeland Security Investigations, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, the FDA Office of Investigations, and the Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. I am likewise grateful to our partners at Europol and Eurojust, and to our law enforcement partners in Austria, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Poland, Brazil, the United Kingdom, and Switzerland, without whom this operation would not have been possible. 
The Justice Department is cracking down on criminal cryptocurrency transactions and the online criminal marketplaces that enable them. In 2021, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco announced the results of another international operation, Operation Dark Hunter, which included the arrests of 150 dark net drug traffickers and the seizure of $32 billion in cash and cryptocurrencies. Last year, together with our German law enforcement partners, we seized Hydra Market, the world's largest and longest running illegal marketplace on the dark web. Earlier this year, we led a coordinated international operation against Genesis Market, a major criminal marketplace that enabled cyber criminals to victimize individuals, businesses, and governments around the world. And today, we have announced an unprecedented international enforcement action against drug traffickers on the dark web. This work will continue. Our message to criminals on the dark web is this. You can try to hide in the furthest reaches of the internet, but the Justice Department will find you and hold you accountable for your crimes. The Justice Department, together with our American and international partners, will continue to disrupt and dismantle darknet markets. We will continue to illuminate the dark web, and we will bring to justice those who try to hide their crimes there. I'm now pleased to turn the podium over to FBI Deputy Director Abate. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Attorney General Garland. Simply put, today's announcement presents a stark warning about the real-world consequences of virtual activity, the criminal and often life-threatening reality of what lurks within that realm, and the clear and direct message that the FBI will never rest until we shine a light on the digital drug lords who knowingly and recklessly push fatal fentanyl-tainted narcotics from the shadows of the dark net. It is a privilege to represent the FBI here today alongside the Department of Justice, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, IRS Criminal Investigative Division, and our partners at the Food and Drug Administration. And to have the chance to speak uh, about our leading and collaborative role in this year's J-Code operation known as Operation Spector, which is not just one investigation, but rather a series of coordinated enforcement actions, uh, as was mentioned since late 2021, involving the work of 16 FBI field offices across the United States, seven additional domestic investigative agencies, and eight international partner governments. As you've heard, similar operations take place periodically, but this year's successes, no doubt, have raised the bar for future campaigns. As we've worked together with our partners to make nearly 300 arrests, seize more than $53 million of ill-gotten cash and cryptocurrency from the traffickers, and to confiscate more than 100 illegal firearms and nearly 2,000 pounds of drugs, we accomplished all this by leveraging a wide range of lawful investigative authorities among each of our agencies and departments. We in the FBI followed leads from prior marketplace takedowns in other cases. We acted on information from international partners. We sent in agents in an undercover capacity. And we took investigative referrals from local law enforcement agencies who responded to overdoses, to name just a few of the actions taken. In addition to those more traditional means, we applied innovative technical methods to uncover the true identities of, the, of these covert criminals attempting to hide in the dark spaces of the internet. We came at this issue together from a multitude of angles, leveraging innovative approaches, and spared literally no resource. All because of the severity of the darknet threat, its impact on our communities and on our nation's growing violent crime problem, in the FBI and our partners' unique abilities to put the people responsible for this devastation behind bars. In just one arrest last year, as an example, the team took down a California-based darknet dealer who used at least nine different marketplaces and employed a web of workers to ship and receive millions of pills to thousands of buyers and potential victims. There, we worked with our partners 
to find and seize over 500 pounds of illegal drugs, high-speed presses that could produce thousands of pills an hour, illegal firearms, and more than 20,000 multicolored fentanyl lace pills meant to look like oxycodone. It should be noted that the darknet is not just a marketplace for illegal and dangerous drugs. It's also one-stop shopping for almost every kind of criminal product or service that's out there. From stolen online credentials, to child sexual abuse material, to fraudulent passports and IDs, to computer hacking tools, and much more. Which makes tackling the dark net not just a law enforcement issue alone, but also a national security challenge and threat. It is also a public health and safety imperative, which is why the operation we're discussing today was focused especially on preventing the sale of illicit drugs. The dark net is one of the most dangerous places for an American or anyone to purchase drugs. And more so now than ever, with dealers consistently cutting their unregulated products with potentially deadly doses of fentanyl, worsening a crisis that is taking tens of thousands of American lives each and every year. This is why, for the first time this year, we sent investigative leads to every one of our 56 field offices to knock and talk with numerous dark net narcotics buyers to let them know that their actions were not anonymous and to warn them about the perils of the purchases they made. And in a further extension of this preventative effort, we worked with the Naval Criminal Investigative Service to create and distribute brochures talking about these same hazards to military personnel who may seek to buy narcotics online. Because empowering the public especially at-risk and vulnerable groups, with information to make better informed decisions, will be just as important as arrests if we're going to solve our nation's opioid crisis. Many people probably think this could not affect them, that the dark net is too mysterious, too distant, and too inaccessible. But the dangers of drugs from the dark net are far too real and far too prevalent, and users never know which pill may be their last. Which brings us to share the tragic story of a 19-year-old from Colorado who was an exceptional student, having made the dean's list every semester in college. He came from a wonderful family, had taught himself other languages, and loved to build computers in his spare time. But some of the packages his family thought were full of computer parts actually contained drugs he had purchased off the dark net. And because of those drugs, that promising young man sadly died of an overdose last year, far too soon. And yet another sad and troubling reflection of the far too many lives lost. An FBI investigation led to the arrest of the dealers responsible for this heartbreaking loss of life. Unfortunately, there are tens of thousands of other stories like this across the country and around the world. So our work to investigate and eradicate these dangerous criminal marketplaces and remove the criminals who run and perpetuate them will not end with today's announcement. As the Attorney General stated, our enforcement efforts will endure, along with the tireless and unrelenting pursuit of those responsible. And through this operation and with this announcement today, the FBI and everyone standing shoulder to shoulder here on this stage hope to make one thing very, very clear. We will not let the shadows of the dark net dim our vision of a safer, more just, and brighter future for our communities. We will continue to work relentlessly, 24-7, together to protect people, to keep human life safe, and to hold accountable and stop those who greedily spread this terrible harm. Thank you. We, uh, Attorney General, we noticed uh, that uh, Mexico is not listed among the countries that you have as cooperating in this uh, in, in this uh, operation, and it raises the question of, of whether you and and the others here believe that the Mexican government and law enforcement is doing enough 
uh, on this issue of fentanyl and, and the trafficking uh, across the border. And I have a second uh, off topic question. So, um, as you know, I've been to Mexico myself twice, meeting with the Secretary of Defense, meeting with the head of the Navy, meeting with uh, my Attorney General counterpart and the Security Minister. Um, we, and they have been here twice. Uh, we ha all of us can be doing more. All of us can be working harder, although it must it feels to all of us like we are at you know working at, at the maximum. Um, we need the cooperation of Mexico in all kinds of matters, and um, we will continue uh, to work on that problem. You have another. Yes, I do. Um, uh, you assured Congress uh, some time ago that the Hunter Biden investigation would be conducted without any kind of political interference. Uh, and I wonder uh, if you would believe that, you, that that is still the case, uh, if that is still the case, that the investigation is not being interfered in any political way, uh, since a, uh, an agent from uh, Mr. Lee's agency uh, has now come forward claiming whistleblower status and, and alleging that there has been some kind of interference. Yes, it's still the case. I stand by my testimony, and I refer you to the U.S. Attorney for the District of Delaware, who is in charge of this case and capable of making any decisions that he feels are appropriate. Okay. Um, so this is just the no uh, latest of a number of takedowns that you've done uh, recently dealing with dark net marketplaces, and I just, I'm just wondering if you're seeing any sort of overall reduction in this activity as a result. Um, you know, what is stopping these people who were, you know, just using this marketplace from jumping to the next one? And then I also have a second question, too. All right. And first one I'm going to do a little bit and let Paul speak next, and then I'll come back to your second question. Yes, we have noticed, obviously, when we take down a dark net that we disrupt uh, uh, the situation for some time. But you're also right. People can reconstitute. There are other people. That's why we now have gone three. There is a bit of a whack-a-mole problem here, and we are whacking as hard as we can. We are getting more and more sophisticated uh, and more and more capable of finding um, um, both the perpetrators uh, and the victims and the customers. Uh, let me uh, ask Paul if you want. Oops, sorry. Paul, if you want to say more on that? Sir. Uh, yeah, exactly what the Attorney General said. We do believe it's having an impact on our, our enforcement efforts on those who are pushing these often fatal uh, products on the Internet. There's no doubt about that. But also, we're really focused on reaching out to potential victims and better informing them and bringing awareness to the public so that uh, people can put themselves in the best position to protect their own lives. And I think those two things together, we're going to see an increasing uh, effect in a po very positive way uh, and progress that we're making through our, through our combined efforts on both sides here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, during a recent congressional hearing, you also mentioned that um, John Durham's report would be done relatively soon. I'm just wondering what your time frame for that is. Have you received the report, and what are your plans to make it public? Uh, no, I haven't received the report. And uh, any other questions you have about Mr. Durham's work, uh, I recommend you refer to Mr. Durham. And last question, Kevin. Yes, um, on, the, on this case uh, specifically, you mentioned the one death. Um, uh, that the deputy FBI director had, had mentioned. Um, are you able to tie a, uh, a number of deaths to the cases that you brought in as part of this operation? And yeah. then I have a second. Okay, before we do either of those, point of personal privilege, I understand, Kevin, this is going to be your last press conference. Unfortunately, it's not my last press conference. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for your service. You've done a great job in bringing the work of the department to the American people and in holding us accountable, and I'm grateful for it. Uh, now, uh, continue with your hard question, um, as we expect. Um, uh, I'll have to uh, go on to uh, Paul on the question of this particular operation. We do have uh, quite a number of cases now where we have succeeded in tying uh, sales to deaths uh, and prosecuting accordingly. Um, but I don't know whether any are directly uh, beyond the one Paul said are, are related to this, so I'll let him answer that. It's hard to quantify the number of deaths from this potentially related to this particular operation. There's the tragic case uh, that I mentioned. We know that there's far too many more. That's the bottom line. That's where we're going to continue uh, these efforts and continue to work uh, to protect people and keep lives safe and get the bad guys uh, off the street and stop them from doing this. Um, but I don't uh, have another, an exact number uh, within uh, the current operation other than to say it's not just one, uh, and it's, it's far, far too many, sadly. And I have a 
I told you that. I'm, I'm a follow up so I can get my money's worth here. Uh, uh, as a former judge, how concerned are you about these reports uh, of the Supreme Court justices failing to abide by disclosure requirements? And is there anything there for the Justice Department uh, to look at? Uh, well, uh, as you know me well enough by now, I'm not going to be able to comment on, uh, on that kind of a question. And, uh, as a general matter, as a federal judge, uh, I have always believed that the judiciary uh, should follow and be held to the highest ethical standards. That continues to be my belief. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.